Leviticus chapter 3. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be, ma be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall be taken shall he take away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on, on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons shall sprinkle the blood there, thereof round about upon the altar. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat thereof and the whole rump it shall he take off hard by the backbone. And the fat there covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, with the kidneys it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of it, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. And he shall offer thereof his offering, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, with the kidneys it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statue for your generation throughout all your dwellings, that ye eat neither fat nor blood. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you... For the visitors that came today, Lord, I pray that you'd bless our service, Lord, and I pray that you'd give our, our pre preacher power to preach your word and fervency, Lord. I pray that you would just, he would just show us what you've shown him through his studies, and Lord, I pray that you bless the service, Lord, and bless the preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Okay, Leviticus chapter 3, everybody's favorite book. All right, okay, so... We see in Leviticus, uh, we remember, of course, that these are, uh, these are sacrifices given by the command of God from the tabernacle. Uh, the first verse there uh, in chapter 1, it says, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. And so we see that these offerings in the first few chapters of Leviticus are for offerings that God is asking of the people to do. And then, of course, we also remember that, uh, that the Lord has already done a lot for everybody in, in Exodus in bringing them out of Egypt and to actually uh, the Passover, starting with the Passover lamb and, uh, and how that, that is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, the Passover sacrifice, the blood upon the doors, a picture of blood upon our heart and so forth is the sacrifice that God did for us. And so all these things that God did in Exodus for us and, and going through the Red Sea and all these things that it pictures, you know, salvation, baptism, uh, the, the, the bread and water, a uh, picture of, of helping with the Word of God and, and, the, and, and Jesus Christ and so forth, the, the bread and body. And, and all these things that are pictures that extend to the New Testament, pictures that God has done for us. Uh, and so he's done everything in Exodus chapter 40 for them, and now they have fellowship with the Lord, and now they can communicate to God out of Leviticus. Uh, now Exodus is what God did for them, Leviticus is what they can do for the Lord. 
Uh, this is not something that to, to receive salvation because salvation's already been given to them out of Egypt. That was in the Old Testament, the outward appearing and the example of our salvation. Salvation, baptism, uh, the word of God, the leaders, they were all given to Israel before they ever had to give a sacrifice. And so these sacrifices are pictures of things that we do, uh, not for salvation, but because of salvation. Amen. And so these things here in, in Leviticus, uh, we first start out with Leviticus chapter 1. What can you as a person do for God? You can give yourself wholly over to God. You know, that burnt sacrifice was a picture of you going onto the altar and completely burning up into the spiritual realm. Because when something is burnt up on the sacrifice, the... Uh, the smoke is a picture of something uh, going from the physical, which is material and you can touch it, to the uh, spiritual, which is, uh, which is non-material, and it kind of goes up into the air and rises and disappears as it's burnt up, turning matter into one form, uh, which is solid, to the gaseous state, which is a picture of going from the physical to the spiritual. And so you have that in the burnt offering that if I were to go up on that altar and burn myself completely up, I would be quite literally in the presence of the Lord because I'm dead, right? <laughs> that's, that's not very practical for an earthly ministry if I say I'm going to give myself entirely to God and then I have burnt myself on the altar. Uh, that is not practical for my ministry here on earth. And so what these people would do, instead of you burning yourself upon the altar to symbolically show that you're now spiritual and the spiritual uh, servant, you take the lamb or the cattle or the cow or, or the doves and you put your hands on it and you say, this animal is in my place, this animal is in my stead, just as Jesus Christ was in my stead and the burnt off in, in, in the just as he is in the uh, Passover sacrifice was in my place, he, he took that punishment on himself, and then I consumed his uh, body and, and, and so forth in the eating of the, the roasted meat and so forth, and the blood was applied to the doorpost as a picture of his blood uh, being applied unto me, his righteousness being applied to me as a coat, and his, uh, his salvation cleansing me. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, the blood uh, was a picture of them being covered by the blood, but here in the New Testament we have a better covenant which cleanses us by His blood, doesn't just cover like His blood did the doorpost of their house. And so, so the Lord did that, uh, and then me, I'm saying this animal is going to be now in my place, just as that lamb uh, in the Passover lamb was a, was a substitute for Jesus until He could actually come. Uh, every year they would have the Passover lamb, and then when Jesus Christ came and gave Himself for us, He was the uh, substitute for us and not just a lamb to cover but uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ to take away the sins of the world as John the Baptist proclaimed and so here in this passage uh, they have in the burnt sacrifice the lamb is a substitute for myself so I put this animal on there in the burnt sacrifice it completely burns up it's entirely given to the Lord picturing me entirely in the spiritual world given over to God but because I'm alive still, and I'm not on the altar, I can go now live my life as a living sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, for uh, for Israel. And just as in the Old Testament, they could live, uh, now that they, the Lamb has been given their place as a burnt sacrifice, they can live, be a living sacrifice for God as a nation. As a nation, they could uh, show forth the light unto the Gentiles. They could show forth and do these things as a nation. They could do these the, the picture of them living as a nation uh, for the Lord. And so we understand that this is what the sacrifice symbolizes. It's not about the animal taking away their sins, but rather I, uh, the animal being in place of myself, doing these things for the Lord. And so the birth sacrifice, giving myself entirely to the Lord as a living sacrifice to uh, the Lamb, took my life place on the altar, and so now I live uh, to work for the Lord. Uh, and and uh, so the second chapter we understand was about the fact of the things that God gives to us, the harvest, the meat offering. Uh, the meat offering is a picture of every time that God gives me something, of that increase, I give it back to the Lord. It is uh, tie, tied in with the tithe and showing that because I'm now a steward of the Lord, I'm a servant of God, uh, everything that I have is entirely belongs to the Lord, and everything that I receive is entirely from God, from His land, 
that everything that is from his land, because Israel was their land, it was God's land, and he allowed them to live in it as they lived righteously and as they lived obediently to him. As his servants, uh, they would live in the land, and then God would bring the harvest, and he would not cause it to fail uh, as long as they were holding in their national covenant. And so they would, out of thankfulness, give back to the Lord to sustain the Lord's offices and so forth. So we talked about that in chapter 2, uh, how that their their meat offering was out of their increase from their field, whether it was the, the bare grain, whether it was the heads of corn, or whether it was ground and flour, or whether it was the finished product in a cake or, or, a, uh, or a food product. They could offer it uh, at any stage uh, for the Lord. Uh, in any different way they wanted, and that was for the sustaining of the Lord's offices for the Lord's house. The the increase was for the Lord's house and wherever God put His name. And so that brings us up to chapter three. What is the second? What is the third thing that God wants us to know? He wants us to know about peace. Uh, see, there's the, this process before we even get to the sin offering. He wants us to be at peace. He wants us to be reconciled back to Him. He wants us to be uh, at peace with one another. He wants us to be reconciled with one another. So the, uh, the peace offering is to be one of peace. It is to offer peace. So oftentimes in this world, people tend to uh, focus, uh, they have their priorities in, in wrong areas. We need to understand that just as we uh, are to primarily be entirely given over to the Lord as a living sacrifice, and in chapter 2 we understand that we need to be sustaining the Lord's offices and, and to uh, be out of a grateful heart for things that God has given to us, so too in chapter 3 we need to uh, be, as, as Paul, I believe Peter said it, uh, that how much ever lies within us be at peace with all men. Uh, to not try to cause strife, not to, cr to try and cause division uh, for no reason. So oftentimes people, they, well, I, I, don't, I don't really mind this, but, but people, they try to, 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 they have their theology and they have their doctrines at such a high level to where, while it is important to understand this on Fundamental Baptist, that it is very important to have correct doctrine, it's very important uh, to divide away from error and so forth, but they sometimes put this on such high a level that it takes precedent over every single thing in their life, and that so that if they have something slightly different in their theology or their understanding from a brother or a sister, then that brother is not just uh, somebody they can't fellowship, but with a heretic. You know, so so divided, so divisive sure. that nothing can ever be done because nobody is willing to be in fellowship with anybody else. And then and then they also make the mistake of saying, well, uh, on, on the opposite end, well, I, I need to have peace at such a high level that even if somebody's a pagan and, and, and wants me to worship in their worship centers and, and wants me to go there and fellowship with them, that, that I gotta go and I gotta I gotta just kind of ignore the gospel. I gotta kinda ignore the things that God tells me to do and I gotta ignore where God tells me to stand so that we can all be in unity. You know, this is an error, this is a mistake. Uh, but the thing is that we ought to not, w there needs to be a balance there, but we see in these offerings to the Lord, we need to dedicate ourselves to be at peace with all, in, in starting with God. Yeah. And, and so the thing is that when we are at peace, the Bible says that he maketh even your enemies to be at peace with you. And, and so uh, even when you disagree with somebody or you say, I cannot stand with you because you are in doctrinal error, I can still be at peace with them. I don't always have to be in strife or fighting or, or, or debating and, and, and arguing. Uh, uh, there was a guy I was having a conversation with online, and he, uh, uh, he asked this question. Well, why does in 1 Corinthians they use the word castaway? And then why in, in this other thing uh, he uses the word reprobate? And what's the whole point? Well, I, expl I, you know, I, I explained the reason why uh, this castaway is about somebody who used to be useful to the Lord, but is no longer useful for the Lord anymore. And so the guy, God had to cast him away. He had to, he's no more of you, so he, he's, he's set aside. He's, uh, he's worthless for the ministry, and so God sets him aside. Uh, that does not mean he's lost. It does not mean that he's lost salvation, but rather he is no longer of use for the Lord, so God's going to go and use some other tool. He's going to go use some other thing for his divine purpose. 
And then reprobate, I explained to them that reprobate is somebody who was never saved and then they are being tested of the Lord. God's calling them and calling them and calling them and they keep on saying, no, I don't want you, God. I don't want you, God. I don't want you, God. And then finally, uh, through the process of time, God said, hey, I can't use you. I can't call you. you. You refuse to even submit to my will. You refuse to make peace with me. I've been saying, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, uh, I shall make them white as snow. And he's reasonably with them. And they're like, no, I want to live my own life. I don't, I don't care about you. I know you sacrificed your life for me, but I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to trample <coughs> that underfoot. I don't like it. And so I'm explaining this to him. And then, and then he, and, and then, you know, it, Obviously, within context, and then because he doesn't believe in the King James Bible, he wants to uh, he wants to make excuse for this, and he says, "Well, it's the same Greek word." And I was explaining to him, "Well, no, you know, you cannot take, uh, you cannot woodenly take you know, a little translation uh, process here for you. You cannot take one Greek word and then always use the same English word because that one Greek word does not equal that English word. Uh, it depends on the context, and depend, and you can have." It's better, more accurate to translate one Greek word uh, on the context with several different English words uh, because it does not have an equal Sorry. exchange. And I was explaining this to him. You cannot just say castaway in both sections because uh, a reprobate is not a castaway. He was never possessed in the first place. He was never the Lord's. And, and then, and then, and then a, a reprobate, you know, the reprobate was never the Lord's. And then the castaway was the Lord's, but then he, he was using it. It's like when you're using a tool and it breaks, you cast it away, right? But if you never had the, the broken tool in the first place, you don't have it to cast away. And, and so the same Greek word in this context is obvious in Greek. But it's not in English, so you need to use castaway versus reprobate. And, and so I'm explaining this to him. It's like, well, you made the same error as the uh, King James translators. I was like, seems you made up your mind. Good for you. <laughs> and then I just finished the conversation cast with away. that. I just <laughs> cast it away. You know, cast away that conversation. You know, it says, I don't have a problem with discussing with my brothers uh, questions or, or maybe some reasons why or or or, uh, or they have a different opinion and so we discuss it. But then when he's going to go around correcting me and and uh, trying to be contentious with me, then I was like, okay, uh, you, you know, the Lord says uh, one day one guy esteemeth the day above another. You know. Be settled in your own mind. If you're settled in your own mind and you're just having this conversation to be contentious, then go ahead, be contentious with somebody else. I, get, I got better things to do. I want to be a peacemaker. I want to be at peace. If somebody has a different opinion than I, and I believe that I'm speaking the truth, then I can speak with them and have a conversation with them peacefully. I don't have to be contentious with him. And so we understand that even in division, we can be peacemakers. We can be at peace with somebody. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. So oftentimes people are so theologically correct, they destroyed their spirit. They, you know, you have to have both. You have to have the correct spirit, and you also have to have the correct theology. They go together. As you, But the spirit is the foundation of your theology. So oftentimes people get so high-minded thinking that they have their, their theology so accurate that they forget to work on their spirit. They forget to realize, hey, uh, be long-suffering. You know, so oftentimes these the, uh, online theologians, they're so impatient. They're not long-suffering. They, they forget the fruits of the spirit. They forget to develop those. And so even in, in so what this offering is doing and reminding them, uh, just as you, first of all, have to be a complete burnt offering and, and, and a living sacrifice for the Lord to do everything for the Lord, based upon your life and so that everything that comes into your life in chapter 2 has to go out based upon your gratefulness to the Lord for giving to it in the first place and in maintaining the Lord's house, being a good steward of the things that God has given to you. In chapter 3, even before you get to the sin offering of chapter 4, he says before you even have to deal with your own sins, you need to be at peace with yourself. This is a good example in the New Testament would be Matthew. Uh, in the book of Matthew, I believe it is uh, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, he says, Ye have heard that it said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. Obviously, if you kill somebody, you're not at peace with them, right? Uh, but I say unto you <clears throat> that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, I'm just angry person. I I, I don't. I, I'm always looking for some reason to be angry with somebody. 
and without a cause. Now, obviously, there are good reasons to be angry. Somebody uh, hurts your family. Somebody is mean to you. They do something wicked. It, it's good to be angry at them because they're doing something evil and they need to be at peace with you and they won't do it and so you become angry at them. God is oftentimes angry with the wicked every day. Why? Because he hates the wicked? Rather, because he hates the fact that they will not make peace with them. They will not reconcile with them even though he's given them every opportunity. It says, What's a, who, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, uh, just being mean and insulting, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So oftentimes we, we look at somebody and see their foolish ways, but we should not have that as a priority, try to, try to make somebody look like a fool, but rather to reconcile that person, even if they are being foolish, to reconcile them back to peace. It says, therefore, thou bring thy gift to the altar. You're bringing a gift to the Lord, uh, and you're doing the proper sacrifices. And there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. So if you're bringing a peace offering to the Lord, and, and you're saying, hey, this is to, make, to, to show that I'm at peace with God, and to uh, symbolically show that, uh, that I am uh, in fellowship with God, but you're not in fellowship with your brother that you can see that is on earth, and then you have ought against, he says, and that ought word covers a lot of things, you know. Uh, it is not just kind of like, uh, well, we hate each other. So he says ought. It has ought. You know, Matthew chapter 18 is used the same word. If you, if you have ought against your brother, you're to go to him in secret. You're to make peace with him as best as possible. If you still cannot make peace, go take two more people with you. Try to make peace. And then if you uh, if you can't make peace at that point, then, and you still have a lot against your brother, you bring him before the church, and then try to make peace. And then if no peace can be made, and then the decision is made, hey, this guy is in contention, this guy is wicked, this guy is not being reconciled, and is not reconcilable, then we have to treat him as a heathen and a publican until he changes his ways, until he repents, until he reconciles himself. And, and then, then we make peace with them. So the whole process is always about making peace, not about making division. And so we need to understand that, yes, there are times when we have to divide, but the, 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 the process must always be of one of making peace and reconciliation. It says, there, if, there, if, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. Just as, just as we also take the, uh, the Lord's Supper, and we realize that we have ought against our brother or sister, or we have a sin or something that we need to take care of. We need to take care of it before you take the offering. You need to take care of it and get it right with the Lord in prayer uh, before you do it, and then and then go right to your brother and make that peace. That's why oftentimes when you have the Lord's Supper, a lot of churches will give you an opportunity to pray to the Lord, to give an opportunity to reconcile yourself with God, give an opportunity to uh, apologize to a brother or a sister, uh, or give you... You know, some churches also give an advanced warning. Hey, we're going to have the offering in two weeks. You know, hey, uh, make sure that you're at right with the Lord and at right with your brother and your sister and the Lord uh, before we take that. Because if you take it unworthily, if you take it without having the spiritual aspects of the offering, then it's not an offering. It's an abomination to the Lord. The outward appearance without the inward, uh, inward heart is an abomination to the Lord. You have to have both mercy and truth and tithe of your mananas for it to be an actual tithe. Uh, and so he says, Leave therefore thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So the, these offerings that the children of Israel are giving, they have to first make sure that they're doing it personally before lifting it up uh, spiritually. And so this is why the laying on of hands saying, this is what I have been doing, and then this animal is taking my place in the spiritual area so that I can do the physical things. So that's why a lot of times in the Old Testament you would have uh, people that are giving offerings, but they don't have the heart. And God says, your, your burnt offerings and your peace offerings are an abomination to me because your heart is not right with me. Uh, your mouth speaks one thing, but your heart is far from me. You're not at peace with me. You are in contentions. You are doing a ritual. And so we need to understand that the things that we do have to be for making of peace before anything else. Before uh, and, and, and the burnt offering is... What you do for the Lord in, the, in chapter 2, the, the uh, increase is what you do for the Lord. And chapter 3 is what you do for the Lord, but it's also what you do for your brothers 
and your sisters as well, uh, to make peace with them. He says, if thy oblation be a sacrifice of a peace offering, if, it, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or a female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord, and he shall lay his hands on the head of this offering, and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron and his sons and his priests shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And so, he shall, and verse 3, he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and, and it lists all the kidneys in verse 5, and Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is upon the fire. It is a sweet offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And so we understand that just as the burnt offering uh, is is burnt up uh, completely to the Lord, the peace offering is all is divided into two. Uh, some meat is for the individual. Some meat is for the uh, for the priest for their meat. So chapter two uh, also gives sustenance of the corn and the bread and the and the and the uh, the harvest food to the priest, and then. Chapter 3 gives meat offerings for the priest as well as, I believe, the sin offering as well. It gives meat to the priest, and so it is part of their substance. And look where it says to give this peace offering. It says, kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, the door of the tabernacle is where the priests get baptized and, and washed in the laver and so forth. And they, and they go in and out of the temple right there, and they, they're cleansed there. And so it is killed there at the uh, congregation of the door. It's not just killed anywhere, it's killed there. And so we understand that a good place to get right with the Lord is at church. You know, A good place to get right with the Lord is his house, where he puts his name, uh, wherever he goes. Uh, you make peace there, you offer it there. Just as in the New Testament, they went and offered the offering at the apostles' feet and so forth, so too uh, is the offering made there. Make peace there with the Lord uh, in the congregation. You know, don't make it a secret thing. Make it a public thing. I was wrong. I, I, need, I need to be right. I need to reconcile back to the Lord. And he shall, uh, and and uh, and of course the the priests help them in this. Oftentimes people are not sure how to make peace with one another. You know how sometimes you say, well. I have a brother or a sister and we've lived this way all our lives and we're always being fighting and bickering and so forth and I don't know how to make peace. Uh, I don't know how to reconcile myself and so the priests are there to help make the sacrifice. They are to help to, to do it and so too in the New Testament, so too the officers of the church, if you are not able to, to reconcile the Matthew chapter 18 where you go at peace, try to make peace with the brother uh, secretly and then you gain your brother or you try to through the church uh, the two or three elders or whatever go and help you uh, or uh, the church as a whole try to help you in making this peace and so so too is the offerings all the offerings are helped by the priest making these offerings and uh, so we see this and and the and also notice here is if this offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock male or female shall be without blemish and also is that it's going to be uh, in uh, it is to be burnt as the burnt sacrifice in chapter 1 you're giving yourself holy unto the Lord in chapter 1 the uh, burnt sacrifice is burnt as the burnt sacrifice is burning on the altar is when the peace sacrifice is supposed to be uh, is supposed to be slain and then is supposed to be divided and offered up so uh, the burnt offering is uh, for the Lord Entirely, it doesn't go to the priest. It doesn't go to the person offering it. Uh, that animal is entirely, whether it's a, 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 a part of the herd uh, or, or or a heifer, or if it's a a lamb, or if it's a dove, the burnt offering goes entirely to the Lord. is completely burnt up. But the peace offering is divided up between the Lord, the priest, and the uh, the individual, and and perhaps somebody he's making peace with. And Aaron and, and uh, this. It, as the burnt offering is burning, the, the peace offering goes on top of the burning burnt offering. So these two are burnt together. And so if you understand this, that this peace that God has made with us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the, on the, uh, on the cross is, uh, is to go together, the reconciliation is to go together with the, the, uh, the peace offering. So not only did the... the the burnt offering, uh, so we give ourselves entirely over to the Lord in salvation, and then the peace offering is to be brought alongside with it on top of it. So, before we bring the peace offering, we need to be reconciled to the Lord, 
and, and the our offering are entirely up to the Lord. And then and then this peace comes along with it as a same time offering. And so it's two different offerings, but it is the same time it is given. And, and so here reconciliation and peace are, are two of the same things. When you are reconciled back to the Lord, he brings peace to your life. And, and so these two things go together. Uh, and Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice. It's upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is upon the fire. So it's already burning, and it is an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. And when God sees that you're reconciled, you make peace not only with God, but with everybody else around you, then it's a sweet savor. He enjoys that. And, and so and so it's important to understand that when God sees you offering yourself entirely up to him, but then you go off and hate your brother, he said, hey, you said you're entirely mine, but you have no peace with everybody else around you. Uh, that's not sweet savor to me. What I want as a sweet savor is you giving yourself entirely over to me and to make peace with one another. In the New Testament, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, we're not given the ministry of contention or my theology is better than your theology. My the you know, you're, you've given the ministry of peace, reconciliation, one with another. And so in understanding this process, we need to understand that we need to, as Romans chapter 14, verse 19 says, let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. It's fine if you have a conversation with somebody where you disagree, but as long as you're, if the conversation is edifying, then you can have the conversation. It's not a problem. But the moment it starts being about attacking one another and making division and, and hating one another, and even if you leave divided or, 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 or still of different opinions, if you left edifying one another, it's just like Smokey the Bear, you know, leave your campfire the better, uh, campsite the better than you found it, or whatever. Uh, it's the same way. You need to learn to follow after the things which make for peace, and things therewith we may edify one another. So if you're given holy over to the Lord, and you have a brother or sister that may disagree with you, but they're also given holy over to the Lord, you need to be at peace with that person, regardless of your differences. Uh, and so... And also, as we're younger, as we're learning, oftentimes we have different things that get in the way of making peace with one another. And, and so, as, especially as a younger person, uh, Paul gave this example in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 through 26. He says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness. Now, that righteousness was given to us because of Jesus Christ. We are not found in ourselves having our own righteousness, as Paul says, but having the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, our righteousness is filthy rags, but his is pure and white. So when we're given completely over to God, that means that we are completely the Lord's to deal with. That means that we are dealing not in our own righteousness, which is kind of like, oh, I'm right all the time. Ah, this and uh, strife and contention. But rather it's saying, hey, I'm tempted to be strifeful in this moment. But let me use the righteousness of Jesus Christ to help me be peaceful in my discussion, in my edification, in my disagreement. Uh, he says, flee awful useful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call, call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So if you know that the person you're speaking to is, has already called upon the Lord out of a pure heart, you know they're saved, you just have dis disagreements with them or, or you have different practices, then you need to be at peace with them. You need to be at love with them. You need to be long-suffering with such a person. Uh, knowing that they... But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender stripes. If you have a question that everybody's been arguing about since kingdom come and, and, and you know your conversation is not going to add any other information to it, you just avoid that question. Don't worry about that question. Even if you want to contend for it, don't worry about it because if it's now, obviously, there are things like salvation and, and, and uh, you know, the deity of Christ and so forth and, and, and these things that are important and the way we uh, structure our life and so forth. But uh, foolish and unlearned questions being the, the minor details of something or, or, or the, uh, well, what is this word supposed to mean or is that word, supposed, you know, all these little meaningless discussions that people armchair all the time. Avoid those. Don't worry about those. They're not edifying anyway. They only gender strife, so why even deal with them? You can't, if you can't enter a conversation with edification, then don't enter the conversation. You know, if you can't say anything good at all, you know, just like Thumper or whatever that was, you know, if you, if you cannot say anything good, don't say anything at all. Uh, and so, 
And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Uh, I try to teach in my conversations online, I try to teach and be patient. I try to be uh, patient and not gender strife, but to teach and be patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Well, I'm right, and so I'm going to type like I'm right. You know, No, be meek about it. Be <coughs> meek about it. Be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God uh, preventure will give them repentance unto the knowledge of truth. So oftentimes there are people that are spiritually right, but they don't have the knowledge of the truth. They have zeal without knowledge or something, you know, and they, they're just bashing out that, that keyboard. I do a lot of stuff at night, so most of my stuff is online. So anyway, uh, so there's where my examples come from, right? Uh, but, uh, but here, be gentle unto all men, have to teach patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. A lot of doctrine out there opposes you and does not edify you, and, and, and the end thereof is death. But I need to be, even though I'm desirous for them to get right doctrinally, I need to do it in the right spirit. And so I need to make peace through the right spirit, not in contention, uh, in meekness instructing uh, those that oppose themselves. Because if I do this properly, then God, not myself, but God will give them repentance unto the acknowledging of the truth. Because it's God that brings the peace, and we're acknowledging it in our sacrifice of love. Uh, in meekness, and, the, and verse 26, And they that may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So oftentimes we have this mentality in our minds, if somebody has a theological thing different from us, then they're automatically a heretic, and they're automatically somebody that should be shunned and, uh, uh, and should never be around, but we know that they're saved, but yet they're heretics or whatever. And so we act rudely or mean to them and, and, and try not to make peace with them, or we act in the wrong spirit. But the scriptures tell us to make peace. It tells us that even though they're wrong and they even oppose themselves, we need to realize that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil by the grace of God, uh, who are taken captive at his will. So oftentimes people in sin are taken captive by the devil, and so oftentimes people in wrong theology are taken captive, and they cannot grow in the Lord because their, their men mentality is being taken captive by the devil, by his sorceries, and yet by our spirit and making peace, we can the Lord can give them ability to escape that mental snare. Uh, so also... Titus chapter 3, verse 8 through 11 gives us, uh, gives us uh, uh, some advice as well. It says, This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. You know, are my works being good? Are they edifying? Are they peaceful? These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Now, arguing all these little details, they're unprofitable. Uh, and a man is a heretic after the first and second admonition. Even if you think somebody is a heretic and not worth your time, you give them at least two chances. You, you give them, you, you try to be patient with them at least twice. And then after that, so oftentimes I see this, is that people continue a conversation after it's already degraded, and they, uh, it's no longer edifying, and, and they've already given the two, two advice. You know, the, the heretic has been already uh, given the truth twice. And then they continue on with the conversation. No, you, you need to end that thing. There's no point in that. It, even if uh, you give them twice, and then you're done. A man is a heretic after the first and second admonition. Reject. That means don't have a conversation with them anymore. Uh, don't worry about the guy. Uh, let somebody else deal with them. Knowing, because if every Christian gives every heretic two times, then there will be plenty of Christians to, to mess with the guy, all right? So don't worry about it. Uh, knowing that he that is subverted, because a heretic is somebody who is subverted, and sinneth, being condemned of himself. And the heretic, now sometimes because of difference of opinions or whatever, is not a heretic. What a heretic is, is somebody who is subverted and sinneth. If your theology causes you just to have a different opinion, but not sin, it's not a heretic. Uh, it's just somebody who has a messed up theology. Uh, but if somebody has a theology that causes them to sin, or causes them to, like some people say, well, it's okay to drink a bunch of wine because the Bible doesn't give a strict prohibition. I got two, three, and then they get drunk. Then they're causing themselves to sin through that. You know, and, and that's not a good thing. But, but here we have that a sinneth being condemned of himself. 
the heretic, you know, is, is going to condemn himself anyway, and so you, you don't worry about him. Uh, some people use the excuse, well, I'm worried about everybody else who's listening to him. Well, don't worry about it. The Bible says cut it off, reject it. Be at peace with yourself and with others, and don't be striving with these people to no profit. He said, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 15 also explains, follow peace with all men, not just the ones you like, not just the ones that, that you are in your circles, but follow peace with all men. He says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Peace and holiness without, all, without which all men shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble. So oftentimes when you get into these conversations with somebody that is wrong and gender strife, then you end up having bitterness in your heart. And the bitterness does not edify the Lord. It does not bring peace in your life. And it just causes contention in your life to be miserable. And, and so oftentimes you say, well, such and such a person uh, offended me online. Well, well great peace that they that love thy law, nothing shall offend them. Where, where, where's your peace at? You've been offended. You have no peace in your own self. You're bitter. You're wrapped up. You're in knots because you've forgotten to make peace with all men. And even in division, you can have peace. Peace does not mean unity. It just means to be calm, and it means to it means to be at peace, and it means to not be fighting and struggling over every little thing. And one of Job's friends, uh, well, looking diligently, lest any man follow the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby may be defiled. That bitterness in that conversation is not going to just hurt that heretic. It's also going to hurt you in contending with it. Uh, and one of Job's friends said, Dominion and fear are with him that maketh, that maketh peace in high places. And so you need to understand that, that the Lord, he wants peace. He wants peace in your life. And if you fear the Lord, you, uh, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 147, verse 14, it says, He maketh peace in thy borders, and fill thee with the finest of wheat. If you are at peace with the Lord, then He will make peace with you, and He will give you blessings in your life uh, to fulfill you, uh, to, to make things that are peaceful and prosperous. And verse Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, which we mentioned, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now Isaiah chapter 60, verse 16 through 18, it says, uh, about Israel, he's talking about, well, well, I'll skip that, I don't need to uh, talk about that right now, it's uh, too big of a rabbit trail. Uh, moreover, and, and with the Israel, in Ezekiel chapter 37, talking about the end times, it says, moreover, I will make uh, a covenant with, of peace with them, it shall be of an everlasting covenant with them, and shall be peace with them, and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. See, the whole point of God and mankind, even though they're divided from us, the whole process is about peace. It's about reconciling the world back to himself. It's about making sure that you're right with God and this, in this process. And, and, and Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So just as Christ died for us to make peace with us and God, so too we need to uh, sacrifice ourselves, sacrifice our pride, sacrifice uh, our contention, sacrifice our bitter strife to make peace with one another, to make peace and reconcile man back to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 20 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So your ministry is not of contention. Your ministry is not of every little detail of our theology. Your ministry is one of reconciliation. Whether the lost to Christ, or whether a brother or sister back to truth, uh, it is a ministry of reconciliation, and when you bring them back, you're supposed to do it in meekness and not in strife. He says, Reconciling the uh, for Jesus Christ hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses on them. Oh, everybody around me is a heretic. Everybody's, everybody's wrong. Every, I don't, I, I'm going to divide from those people. I'm not going to be around those people. I don't like those people because they, they have the wrong theology or they have this wrong thing or they have this wrong pet habit and so forth. 
And he says, not imputing their trespasses upon them. In, in this process of reconciliation, yes, the person's wrong, the guy has wrong theology, the, the, the guy has strife, the guy has bitterness. You guys need to set all those old things aside and use the new thing of reconciliation to say, hey, we know you have these sins. We know you're wrong. We, with the theology perhaps is not right, but we're going to set that aside and reconcile yourself back to God. And once that reconciliation back to God is done, then we can work on the theology. Uh, so oftentimes when, when you're with somebody trying to minister to them salvation, and then they keep on bringing up silly little questions about theology. Uh, does Adam have a belly button? What happened to Adam's, uh, Cain's wife? And, and where did all get the weird, all these weird things and no, come no profit? But then, but then when they get saved, all those things just kind of fall away because they're not important anymore. But those things are set up so that the devil can say, Yea, hath God said, yea, yea, hath God said. Set those things aside. Don't allow those things to gender strife. Don't allow those things to build up bitterness in yourself against your fellow man, but rather set them aside so that you can reconcile that person back to God, as is your ministry. This comes before dealing with sin even. Chapter, chapter 1 of Leviticus is about giving yourself holy to God. Chapter 2 is making sure that every increase is used for the Lord. And then chapter 3 is about making peace with all mankind, starting with the Lord and the priest at the, at, at, the, at the tabernacle, and then with one another. And then after that in chapter 4, you deal with sin. You don't deal with sin first of a person before they get saved. You deal with their salvation first. You deal with the reconciliation back to God. You deal with peace first. Then you deal with the theology. If somebody is lost, you should not even have a single discussion of theology about them until they get saved. And, and so we need to understand that the ministry of peace, not a ministry of division. Right. Not a ministry of strife, not a ministry of anger. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you. By us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And that's our prayer for the lost. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 through 29 says... Uh, and having made peace through the blood of the cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He reconciled us, why can't we do it to other people? He made peace with us, why cannot we make peace with everybody else, all mankind, in the body of his flesh, through death to present the whole, you holy and unblameable, unprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, that means you're not only saved and living in the Spirit, but you're walking in the Spirit, and you've settled a lot of things in your mind, you're settled in your mind, uh, who now, uh, which is unblameable, unprovable in sight, if you continue in faith, grounded and settled, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which ye have preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is giving me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from the ages, from generations, but now has been made manifest to the saints, to whom God would make known that is the riches of his glory and the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that our ministry of peace is not about uh, divisions or own thoughts or anything. It's about us presenting Christ to them so that they can be reconciled. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. It worked in Paul mightily. Why don't we allow it to work in ourselves mightily, this ministry of peace, this ministry of reconciliation? Now, we'll end with this, with this last one point, is the fact that at the end times, when Christ returns, he too will be giving a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice, and he's going to be giving a peace offering sacrifice, and that is the offering of the lost world back to God. And see, there's two ways you can have a peace offering. You either offer the burnt offering yourself, and the lamb in your place, or whatever, the Lord Jesus Christ in your place. You offer the peace offering with the Lord with the lamb in your place, which is Jesus Christ, you offer Jesus Christ in those offerings yourselves willingly given up, or when Christ himself comes back, he will offer that person, that individual, without the lamb, without Jesus Christ, as a sacrifice unto God, a sacrifice, a burnt sacrifice, holy burnt up, 
so that every lost person will stand in judgment before God, and that every person uh, will, and the world will be made peace back to Him. You see, the lost person is keeping peace from returning to the earth, and then when Christ returns, He's going to make this peace offering back to God, so that the earth will be reconciled back to the Lord by fire. And so this this sacrifice of fire by Jesus Christ is explained to us in the in the uh, in Isaiah chapter 34. Let's look there real quick. Isaiah chapter 34 is a picture of the peace offering at the return of Christ. Isaiah chapter 34. It says, in verse 1, we take a look at that. Come near ye nations to hear. Remember, he's going to judge nations when he returns. Uh, ye nations, come and hear and hearken ye people. Let the, ear, let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and the things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury is upon their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out. Their stink shall come up before their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with blood. See, a saved person offering themselves up to the Lord uh, as a burnt offering, and, and a peace offering divided up as a food offering between them and the Savior, uh, making peace is a sweet savor. But the lost world, the lost people that reject God, that are twice dead, that they re, re, utterly refuse to come to the Lord and make peace with Him, reason with God, are going to be His sacrifice, and it's going to be carcasses that stink. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood, and the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and their host shall fall down, and the leaf there uh, fall up from the vine as the falling of a fig from the fig tree. Uh, that is that is Israel being judged there, but that, that's another point. Uh, for the sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, uh, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idoma and upon the people of my curse to judgment. So if you don't if you don't offer yourself up entirely to the Lord now, uh, and you don't partake in His sacrifices of Jesus Christ on your behalf, then He's going to sacrifice you in the final judgment. He's going to sacrifice the lost world so that those lost people will be a sacrifice so that the world one day will be in the millennium reconciled back to God uh, entirely and physically. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood and is made fat with the fatness. Remember in Leviticus chapter 3, it's about the kidneys and the fat and so forth being divided and put upon the altar and, and so forth. And those are the Lord's portion. Here it says, The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, it is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of the rams. For the Lord hath sacrificed in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edoma. And, and it goes on and it explains this. Uh, verse 8, For in the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of the recompense of, our, uh, of the controversy of Zion, See, he's fighting over Zion and the nations that come over to war against it. And then he makes that sacrifice uh, uh, by the sword of his mouth, uh, of burnt sacrifice to the Lord and peace offering back to him. That's in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 9 through 21. Revelation chapter 19. So at the end time when he returns, he says, <coughs> in Re Revelation chapter 19, it says, uh, and the, he saith unto, verse 9, he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these things are true saints of God. So in Leviticus chapter 3, when you divide up this peace offering, burnt burn offering is completely burnt up, doesn't belong to anybody but God. And then chapter 3, the offering is divided up between myself, the priests, and and God on his altar, the, the blood is, is poured out and the, and the fat and the kidneys are burnt upon the altar. And that's the Lord's portion. That's his food. And then in, in, uh, in Isaiah, we see that his portion, the fat and the, and the kidneys and so forth of the rams, that picture of the nations being slain for the Lord, that's his food for the lost to be devoured. And then we who are at peace with the Lord in Leviticus have that food offering with the Lord. And remember when uh, the... Uh, the 70 elders of Israel went up to the mountain and had food offering before the Lord as well, uh, making peace with the Lord. So too, if we do not make peace with the Lord now, then God will make peace with the world later by the sacrifice of this peace offering, which is their own bodies. Their, their physical bodies that sinned against him will become the sacrifice. Uh, and he says, 
which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell down at his feet to worship him. He says, Do it not, uh, and worship God. And then I, verse 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteous. He doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns. He, he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, and white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall tread the wine, priest, wine presses of the fierceness of God's wrath of the Almighty God. And when he had on his vesture, uh, uh, on the thigh, named written, King of King and Lord of Lords, and I saw the angel standing in the sun, and in verse 18, and that he may eat the flesh of kings. Oh, let's go back 17. And I saw the angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather yourselves together into the supper of the great God. See, uh, and the supper is not going to be the people eating it, but the animals. Uh, and ye may eat the flesh of the kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of the mighty men, and the flesh of horses, of them that sit on them, that the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against his army. And of course we can look further on in that, but the whole point is the fact is that is that if we don't make peace with the Lord now, he's going to make peace with the world later. And, and so wherever you want, if you want God to take your place as the uh, substitute sacrifice, you, you take him now, because later, it's not going to be, uh, you're not going to have a substitute. You're going to have your physical body uh, burned in those nations. Those nations will. And then, and then in hell, when the lake of fire comes along, that's going to be a burnt sacrament. You're going to be entirely burnt uh, to the Lord. Uh, the, whatever he gives you and how that works, I'm not sure. But the fact remains is that uh, whether the world is reconciled spiritually through him now or physically later, uh, it's up to the individual. And so the question is, which one will you partake in? Will you partake in into the peace offering and the burnt offering now uh, by the sacrifice of Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf as laying your hands upon him, uh, calling about upon the name of the Lord and, and laying your hands upon his name and saying, hey, I declare this, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ for my righteousness. Or will I say, I reject that. I will give my, and then God say, okay, I'll give you as a sacrifice in, in, in the flames of fire of the lake of fire in eternity. See, that's why it's important to accept the Lord now. Important to accept the Lord uh, because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day He's called upon you and not in the future when everything will be burnt up and reconciled by fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I think the blessing you give us, Lord, I just pray that you'll help us to understand in Leviticus the importance of having these sacrifices, not just physically like in the Old Testament, but understanding these sacrifices in the better New Testament of get, being a living sacrifice, of understanding that everything comes from you and that we need to be ministers of reconciliation, ministers of peace and not of contention and strife. Let us labor to, uh, to do good works and to do righteous things on your behalf because you died for us. You were a sacrifice for us in that Passover sacrifice. You passed us over for your wrath and you laid it upon him. And Lord, I just pray that this wrath will not come at the end times upon anybody here, but they will accept you today. And just I pray. Amen.